The following interview was conducted with Fred E. Lyle, Professor Emeritus of Chemistry for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, January the 20th, 2009 at his office in Indianapolis. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon, Professor Lytle, and thank you very much for your time. You're quite welcome. Um, tell us a little bit about where, you, where and when you were born, your parents and siblings in early years. Okay. Well, I was born in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania in 1943, and I grew up in Sunbury, Pennsylvania, which was about seven miles down the road. Um, I had two brothers. Um, Chuck is four years younger than I am, and my brother Rob died about a year ago, and he was 20 years younger than I was. Wow. <laughs> uh, how about early, uh, your early school days and then a little bit about high school, what went on there? Well, uh, you know, Sunbury sort of, it's in the Susquehanna Valley, but it's buried in the mountains, uh -huh. in a mountainous region of Pennsylvania. Sure. And, um, you know, I really enjoyed school. I mean, school was terrific. And uh, it, I came from a family where neither of my parents were really educated. My, my father dropped out of school in eighth grade. Uh -huh. And my, my mother made it through high school, and she was always really proud of that, mm -hmm. you know, that she was educated. And it was really interesting because, uh, you know, out of the three boys, they had three boys, and out of the three of us, you know, two of us got a Ph.D., and the other one was an electrical engineer from Berkeley. Wow. And, and my poor parents never, ever understood what it was we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> they, worked, they worked with you, though, huh? That's right. <laughs> right. That's right. They worked alongside you. Um, any, when you were in high school, were there any uh, student organizations or uh, a special teacher that you happen to recall that you had? Well, I had a, a terrific background in physics. As a matter of fact, I originally went off to college in physics and not chemistry. Uh -huh. uh, but I had uh, the greatest thing I had in high school was I had a stunning preparation in mathematics. And um, I'm never really quite sure why. You know, it's one of these classic things. It was a person who was, it, uh, I had one teacher in particular who was just really terrific. Sure. And, um, and so, you know, by the time my family decided I should go to college, I, I had this really terrific preparation in all kinds of math. And, and a matter of fact, that's really what I do right now. Okay. You know, I, 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 even though I was trained as a chemist, I, I, down here at Inigo Biosystems, I do a lot of mathematics for them. Okay. Yeah. Super. It just stayed with you all this time. You got a good foundation in high school. Yeah, yeah. Lucked out. And because because I was in physics originally in sure. college, I took all the math that a physics major takes, which okay. is a lot more than chemist. So. Yeah, I see. Okay, dog. Then you went on to college. How did you happen to select uh, this particular one in Pennsylvania? Well, yeah, it was really interesting. My nobody in the family ever thought I was going to go to college, okay. and I was I was apprenticing in an auto body shop. Okay. And, and the, the man that owned it had always wished that he had gone to college and so he talked my father into looking into it and um when we this is a, a great story when we sat down with the guidance counselor in the high school uh -huh. my father and i the guidance counselor said uh you know mr lytle i see that you're a registered democrat therefore i cannot help your son get into college excuse me <laughs> and, and it turned out that uh our dentist was the only Democrat on the school board, and uh, so my dad talked to him, and he said, well, you know, it's hard to believe, but the superintendent of the school district is a Democrat, and he said, that's a real long story, but why, I'll make an appointment with you to go see him, and so we went to see him, and he got me into junior out of college. And, <laughs> that's and, an interesting uh, scenario. So that's how I got to junior out of college. Okay. Yeah. Did you live on campus while you were there? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, there was one year that we lived, uh, they, they didn't have enough housing on campus one year, and a bunch sure. of us lived in an apartment. But other than that, yeah, I lived yeah. on campus. Okay. Tell us about what was campus life like. Any uh, student clubs or what your major? No, was your it, ma Junior out of college um, is a Church of the Brethren school. It started with a Church of the Brethren. And uh, my family's not uh, not members of that particular church, but, but the Church of the Brethren was, uh, let's say, an austere organization. And, they, and so there were no things like fraternity sororities and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, there, there was no smoking on campus, there was no drinking, and, and we were really lucky that there were dances by the time I got there. <laughs> and, and, uh, was it co-ed? Co 
boys and girls? It was co-ed. Okay. Yeah, it was almost it was almost split 50-50 even in those days okay. uh, of okay. men and women. Sure. Um, but they had two programs that they were really well known, and they still continue to be really well known. And, and one of them was chemistry, and the other one was pre-med. And uh, I went there in physics, and the program really wasn't all that good in physics at that time. Since then, we've had a Nobel laureate who came out of the college in oh, physics. Wonderful. But, but, but at the time I was there, um, physics wasn't terribly good, and I, I knew a lot of the chemistry majors, and so I moved into chemistry and finally became a sole chemistry major my senior year. Okay. It, it took me a couple of years to catch up. So. Sure, okay, sounds good. But you had a good experience while you were there. Oh, it was terrific, so for, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was absolutely stunning. That's good, yeah. okay. Then what, uh, after that is it, when you went on to grad school after you finished? Yeah, I went to grad school right away. I went okay. to MIT, okay. and of course, to me, that was a, like a dream come true because yeah, my family, like I said, was not edu educated or sure. anything, and, and so you knew about very few schools, and uh, MIT was certainly one of the schools that, that even my relatives knew about, and uh, and I just, yeah, you know, I went to MIT right after undergraduate work, and, and I graduated out of there in four years, and it, it was just a, an absolutely incredible preparation. Uh, yeah, MIT was such an exciting place to be. It was just unbelievable. Yeah, you had a good experience there. How yeah. did you have, was there uh, some uh, professors there, is that there and you liked the program? Is that why you selected MIT? Yeah. Or? Well, yeah, first off, yeah, going to MIT in itself was, was just a real plus, but it turned out that there was a professor at Juniata College, David Hercules, who I worked for as an undergraduate. And at, before my senior year started, he was hired by MIT in the chemistry faculty. And when he went up there, he wanted to continue the research that a lot of us were doing. And so he actually uh, had four of us in one class, out of my class, went to MIT oh, in graduate wow. school. Followed him. Well, that's, that was a nice arrangement. Yeah, so, yeah, so I ended up working with Dave for eight years. Uh -huh. And, and, and that, was, that was a really good experience also. Good. Yeah. Sounds good. Then uh, is it after that that uh, were there any mi military service? Did you serve in the military at any time? No, I was oh. called up for Vietnam and failed my physical because I'm hard of hearing. Oh, and, okay. And, and in particular, I'm tone deaf. Oh. And, and, uh, and so I have I have I can't hear. I'm absolutely deaf to high frequencies. Okay. And and over the years, you know, Purdue's Department of Audiology has has worked with me on various things. Sure. Yeah. Right. Okay, doc. Then is it the, uh, your career path then takes you to Purdue after you finished MIT? Yeah, okay. yeah, I was here at Purdue two weeks, I think, after I got my Ph.D., wow. and, and those were in the days when a, a lot of people, and particularly in analytical chemistry, did not postdoc. People just went right on to, to, to take a job right out of graduate school. Okay. Had you, uh, did they recruit you, or how did you happen to, was there an opening at Purdue when you came? <laughs> yeah, it turns out. You know, you and I came the same year. I came in 68 as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, what happened was there was a person on the faculty here uh, who was at the head of the analytical chemistry group, and that was my major at MIT was analytical chemistry. Okay. And his name was Lockhart B. Rogers, and, and he went by the name of Buck. And, okay. And so Buck Rogers was here. And he was my academic grandfather. And so if you look in that ac academic family, you're going to find his name. Okay. Uh, yeah. so that, I enjoyed thesis. that. Your, the hand, I enjoyed reading that. It, it's, it's his, it was my thesis advisor's thesis advisor. And uh, so, of course, my, Dave Hercules, my thesis advisor, told Buck that he had somebody coming out who was really good and was going to look for an academic job. And Purdue happened to be looking at that time for a spectroscopist, which is what I was. Mm -hmm. And so I came and interviewed, and uh, it's really funny because it, it, modern students just have a hard time believing this, but I interviewed here um, two and a half years into graduate school. I interviewed at Purdue, and they offered me a job. Wow. And uh, so I, you know, I then it took me another year, year and a half to get a Ph.D., mm -hmm. and then I came out here. And so, so I, had, I was in really good shape in, in graduate school because there I was, unlike most of the people, and I already had a job at, at one of the Big Ten universities. Right. So it's nice really terrific. Your comfort yeah. level was very high. That's exactly right. <laughs> right. That's exactly okay. right. Okay. Well, tell us a little about when you came. I noticed that one of the grants that you got shortly after you came in 72 was an NSF grant for laser research. 
And then the la uh, lab, something else I read, a lab was built about 1974. So this is when you, you continued on in the laser area, is that correct? Right, yeah, okay. what happened was uh, I had never done any laser research myself, uh -huh. but, but when I was at MIT, MIT, where we were, the building we were in was a mixture of physics people and, and chemistry people. And because I had so much physics, I used to hang around the physics students, and I got to know Charles Cowan's graduate students pretty well, and he got the Nobel Prize for lasers in my second year in graduate school. And so this made an impression on me. Oh, and, yeah. and when I came to Purdue, I decided I, I saw lots of ways that lasers could be used in chemistry, and so I decided to start a laser program. Okay. And, and so that particular grant was probably one of the first grants that NSF made to an analytical chemist in lasers. Mm -hmm. and, and so so I, I'm considered, you know, one of the pioneers in analytical laser spectroscopy. You know, right. I go right. back almost to day one. So. Well, it says uh, something I read. You're the first analytical chemist to build a laser in 68, and that's about eight years after the thing, after it was developed. So that's pretty yeah, good. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That, that's a, three feathers in your cap there for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, tell us a little about some of your other research, how that, uh, w and also support, how was the support in those days as, as they went into the 70s and 80s? Well, the support, the support was a lot, the percentage of success was a lot higher okay. than, than it is today. today. I feel sorry for young faculty today, you know, trying to get research support. Um, and so the success rate ran about 40% at the National Science Foundation. That's pretty good. And, and since I was so early into the area, right. and, and you know everybody just considered me a pioneer of, of the area, that NSF actually supported my, my research for 26 years. Oh, from, wonderful. Once you got and in and they knew what you were doing, you, you, uh, you're home free. That's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. And then finally what happened was, um, this would have been in the, in the late 80s, the world started shifting over to biology and biochemistry, and, and I hate to say it when somebody's recording my voice, but I hate biology. God, <laughs> biology and biochemistry, they're just the pits. <laughs> and, and, and so I would not move my research program that direction, and so ultimately it costed me my research uh -huh. and uh, my funding. And so when that happened then, I started to you know, wind down my research program and started doing a lot more administrative work. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, you were also the co-developer of the syn synchronous pumped l dye laser? Is it, yeah. You, you wanted to make a comment? Yeah, I had invented uh, Joel Harris, Ray Christman, and I. Ray Christman worked for Stuart Tobias, and Joel was my first Ph.D. student. Uh -huh. And, and uh, Joel and Ray and I invented this laser called the the, the cavity dump synchronously pumped dye laser, and uh, what it allowed was the generation of wavelength tunable. That is, the laser could change its color and picosecond pulses, so they would be a trillionth of a second, and. Uh, we could vary how often the pulses came out of the laser. You could, I mean, you could get one pulse an hour if you wanted, but we could get them from, you know, whatever you wanted to um, basically four megahertz. Wow. That's and so it turned out that until the invention of a, a laser called the titanium sapphire laser in the late 80s, early 90s, um, the, the synchronously pumped dye laser was the workhorse of picosecond spectroscopists. And so, you know, this certainly helped me gain a lot of fame in the area. And oh, I'm, yeah. it, it, I'm sure it's what got me promoted, <laughs> and yeah. to, you know, tenure to promote it. Sure. And, and because we had all sorts of visitors from all over the world that came to see this laser because everybody knew but how you, good it was. Oh, that's great. Yeah, you know, we never patented it. Um, I, and, you know, we were just in a real hurry to get it published because I needed it for tenure. And, sure. and, and if we would have patented it, I don't think I would have ever gotten tenure if we would have spent the time trying to patent it. Oh, okay. You had to make that decision at that time. Right. Yeah. Okie doke. <laughs> um, we want to talk a little about teaching, particularly that one, that course, that uh, 621, you taught that for a great number of years. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, also, you know, it, it's really interesting. Um, you, you know, I said I had this terrific background in math in high school. Sure. And that, that got me doing a lot of data 
processing and thinking about things, and I had actually built a four-bit computer when I was in high school. Now, when you realize that was in the 50s, it's, it's a little more difficult than it is today to build a four-bit computer. <laughs> yeah, right. And then I when, I was at, when I was at Judy out of college, I, I, I continued on all this math because of my physics major, but we also had a computer show up on campus, and there was nobody there. It was in the summer, and nobody wanted to run it or anything, and so... I started to uh, to work with it and teach myself numeric methods and computer programming. And then eventually when I went to MIT, I supported myself for one year as, as, a, as a chemistry department computer programmer. And in all of this, I built up mathematical techniques sure. you know, from my background and everything else. And, and so I was one of the very early people also who really understood computer programming and algorithms. You, computers yeah. were dumb in those days. Oh. And, a lot and of work to, to program it, be a programmer. Yeah. Right, and so yeah. you you had to really know how to program stuff to get to get accurate and and reliable results out, and so this got me into things uh, where calculations impacted analytical chemistry because people would come to me and ask me how you did this stuff, and so very early on I was associated with 621, but I taught the statistics part of it. Okay, and a faculty member Nick Winograd who's now at Penn State. Well, he's been at Penn State since like 79 or 80. Um, but Nick Winograd was in charge of the course, and finally when Nick went to Penn State, I would just ask if i teach the whole course, which was fine with me. And so the course was a mix of mathematical methods of processing data and electronic methods of processing you know, signals. And so the course was actually for many, many years was simply required of all the analytical graduate students. And uh, the, it was so important to people's lives that here a number of years ago, the, the department had a celebration on the course. And all sorts of people came back telling stories about how 621 helped them in their career and, and so forth. And, and, and my job at Indigo, I have the job because the CEO of Indigo took 621. And the woman I report to, the, the chief scientific officer, she also took 621. Oh, my and, gosh. Oh, my and Lord. So, Super. so they knew exactly what it is that I knew because of this course. And so that's what I do. I sit in my office here, and I actually apply the material in that course to problems in the pharmaceutical industry. Oh, isn't, hey, that's just great. You've got well, well prepared <laughs> and yep. working with colleagues. That's good. Yep. Um, now, you mentioned it earlier a little bit about administrative. So I want to talk about some of your administrative posts that you had, including the acting director instrumentation, but also when you were associate department head for the centers and facilities. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'll leave Graham that out. Yeah, Graham Cooks once referred to me as the, as, uh, the Kelly girl of departmental administration. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, every time they have I know. A problem, when you say Kelly girl, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Some okay. other, other people may not. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah and so, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was a division head. You know, chemistry is divisionalized because it's so big. It's a really big department. Sure. And, and you need some administrative substructure. Otherwise, you'll never be able to run the thing. And, um, and I was a division head from actually just slightly before I became a full professor, which was sort of awkward, for about a seven-year period of time. And then I got back into it again a little later for another five years. And and I always said the reason I was a good administrator was because I hated it. And so I would mm -hmm. find all the ways that there were in the world to smooth it over. So it worked really well and never gave me any problems. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good method. I'll, I'll, I'll keep that in the back of my head. <laughs> right. And so, so what then happened was was when whenever they would have a place where there was a problem with the administrative structure, you know, if there was just an issue on the structure, sure. then then they would get me involved and say sort of, yeah, why don't you fix this? And, and so I was the director of general chemistry, and um, and I was actually an associate head twice. The the first time I had, you know, like pretty close to all the support staff refer to me or you know, report to me and that that was that was pretty onerous that had a, a lot of stuff and then the, the second time then ian rothwell got me involved with uh, having the professional staff instead of the whole support staff just the professional staff and and that was primarily facilities the department was trying to get a grip on its facilities 
and and so I I had these people report to me and and you know it was just really nothing more than a position of, of trying to keep the faculty happy, keep the staff happy, and, you know, get them some kind of rewards and, and you know money to buy things and so forth. So it was keep just, things uh, moving. That's right. right. That's exactly right. Right. Yeah. Any uh, university were you on ever in the Senate or any other university committees that or school co college committees? No, I, okay. I was in. I was on the um, School of Science committee I'm trying to even remember what what like the faculty committee for the school of science or okay. there's some name for it i can't remember what it is and, sure. and i was on that for a number of years and i was on the it, part part of that school of science committee was the educational policy committee and I, and i was on that for a while sure okay um, at the university i never did anything more than just uh, committee work but i was on the the original Committee for the Education of Teaching Assistants, which was called CETA, and uh, that was a really, really important committee that uh, uh, Dean R uh, Provost Ringel had started, Vice President Ringel had started, and uh, it, it dealt with you know trying to get the teaching assistants so they were doing good jobs in classrooms and that they knew how to teach and so forth. And eventually that resulted in the uh, Purdue Teaching Academy. Oh, and okay. I, so I, I was a founding member of the Teaching Academy because right. I was on the original committee. And we used to joke that, that those of us that ran the Teaching Academy did so because it was the only way we could get off a seat because nobody would let us off a seat. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had to get a follow-up and get it up and running, right? Right, yeah. that's right. <laughs> and then I, you know, of course I served on lots of teaching uh, oh, sure. award committees and, and, you know, I was on dean search committees and stuff like that. Right. So just the standard kind. I, I guess the craziest thing I ever had to do, it was luck of the draw, was I, I was the chair of the faculty grievance committee one year. That Ooh. was interesting. Yeah, I'm that sure. was a really interesting job. <laughs> I'm sure it was. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, dear. What about diversity? That, uh, you want to make a comment? That's changed over time, hasn't it, within the confines or it broadened it a little bit? Uh, diversity within the uh, school and the department? Yeah. Yeah. Diversity, yeah. And they sort of, you know, uh, just. Well, the biggest thing I ever did with. In, in the area of diversity, of course, right. was the work with the blind students. Okay. Yes, I was going to ask you about that. How yeah. did that come about? Well, <laughs> it's a really interesting thing. My wife, Joyce, was the head of the general, she ran the general chemistry office. Okay. And all of a sudden, one fall without any, but he warning us, we found we had a blind student in general chemistry. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and so we're trying to figure out what to do with this. And it turned out at that time that there was a graduate student in chemistry whose name was David Schleppenbach, and David's wife was blind. And so he was well aware of, of the technology that existed to help blind students and so forth. And so he was working in the department. The chemistry department actually paid for his salary and a couple other people, and it was called the Visions Lab in those days. Okay. And, and it eventually became Tavis, which was part of the Dean of Students, and then was directly folded into the Dean of Students office. Okay. But, uh, but in those days, it was in chemistry. It was a chemistry operation. And um, they were reading students, these blind, we had a couple of blind students eventually, and they were reading them equations and tests, you know, like these people would be taking math courses. And, and they would read them verbally, these equations, you know, and, and, and they had to remember them in their head because we didn't have the capability of having them in Braille. All right. and, and there's a there is a special Braille called Nemeth Code and I was lucky enough to meet Abraham Nemeth uh, during that period of time. It was in the middle in the middle nineteen nineties. And <clears throat> So what happened was one time there was a meeting in the School of Science about this issue with the blind students, and my wife was at the meeting, and somebody who was in a position of power said, well, this is stupid, it's impossible, you can't convert equations into Braille. And I, she told this to me like on a Friday, and I got incensed about it. And so I went home over the weekend and wrote a small program that converted fairly simple stuff into Braille. Oh my. 
my and, God. And That's... took it back. Oh. And, and she showed it to people and said, well, here it is. It, 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 my husband converted this stuff into Braille. And so they said, but, well, but it won't work with advanced equations. And so then I got really mad because then they were telling me I didn't know what I was doing. And, and so I sat down, and it took me, oh, maybe a semester. But by the end of the semester, I had the world's first computer program that converted equation graphics directly into them with code Braille and, oh. and became really well known in the blind community for it. Uh, Wonderful. That's great. Oh. And, and uh, you know, eventually what happened was Schleppenbach and I published the original program, uh, and not the one that univer the university eventually licensed it, but, but the original one I published on the Internet. And uh, companies who did professional brailing saw it, that it was out there in the open, and they just, you know, a couple of years later, I, I, I was in, you know, being in chemistry, I didn't have time to maintain this crazy program. No. And uh, so eventually commercial operations picked it up, and they just basically lifted my code off the Internet. Mm -hmm. And uh, my stuff was all written in a macro anyway. It was all, a, it was a word-perfect macro. It wasn't even a regular computer language. And uh, so eventually commercial companies yeah, you know, they picked it up and they supported it, and, and so Purdue hasn't used my program since. Wow, I bet they haven't used it since 2000. Yeah. And and uh, but yeah, uh, Sue Wilder was the the person we eventually hired to head Divisions Lab, and then when it moved into the David graduated and it moved into the school the. Uh, into the school uh, or into the dean of students office uh -huh. and there it was called Tavis and and um, they're still around because they Sue Wilder now is, is reports to uh, Tony Hawkins and um, directly and she's in charge of a whole bunch of stuff but but you know I was talking to her not too long ago and and they're still there and they're still providing Braille except that you know they provide it for a lot of other people because because sure. the, the thing we have at Purdue is absolutely unique there, there nobody else has anything like it yeah right are they still using your program though no they're oh, not using my okay. they haven't used my program for years are they using yeah. one of the ones that became available is that what they're doing yeah okay. that's right yeah I just didn't have like I said I oh, you know sure. my job was to do chemistry not to write Braille programs right. but so. at least you got you were the one that got on the ground floor which is yeah, great yeah that's right everybody it was commonly believed it was an impossible task until I simply showed people and said well here it is I mean you know it's working and, and so the, you know the second they saw that that no I actually had a working program well then they knew it was worth their time commercially to, to work on it right. because because it would they could then sell it it, so. it can be done yeah, that's right. right. It can be done. Yeah. Okay. Now, let's uh, awards and honors. So you've got that faculty development from Merck, but you've got an outstanding teacher award from Science and also the Amico, which is now the Murphy, and one of the founding fellows of the Teaching Academy or the Book of Great Teachers. Right. And uh, one of the couple of others certainly is the class of 1922, that Outstanding Innovation Helping Students Learn Award. And that was one of uh, the article that I read for the scientific work had been done with the Braille. Right. Yeah. 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 A lot of those from from '96 on, uh, probably the majority of those teaching awards awards were because of the Braille work. Uh -huh. um, the earlier ones, of course, were not because I hadn't done the Braille work. Sure. But but uh, yeah, that award and then the. You I were the them. Indiana Professor of the Year. Congratulations. That's very yeah, nice. Yeah. Right. No, that was really nice. As a matter of fact, the most exciting thing about that was. My name was on the scoreboard at the at Ross Eight Stadium, you know, between the third and fourth quarter of the IU game. Oh, and uh, yeah, and, and Dr. Beery gave me the award out on the field. I mean, that was really oh, incredible super. thing. Hey, that's super. I, I yeah. probably saw that because I'm, I'm usually at all the games. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Uh, those uh, awards from the American Chemical Society that you've gotten the uh, Chemical Instrument Instrumentation Award. Those are very nice. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. They just said line condition has changed. They're reverting to three. Yeah, we're fine. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I okay. can hear you. The, uh, the American you're Chemical... You're asking me about the awards from the American Chemical yes, Society. Yes, right. Uh-huh. Right. you got well, two of those. Yeah, you know, that's one of the things that I'm really pleased about because, um, you know, lots of times people win research awards and lots of times people... Yeah, you know, we'll we'll win teaching awards, but but I've won both sets of awards, and um, the the Fisher Award, 
it was called the American Chemical Society Award in Analytical Chemistry. To, right. to analytical chemists, it's always called the Fisher Award because that was the company that for years and years and years supported it. Okay. Um, and that was that's the highest honor in, in the United States that any analytical chemist can get. And, you know, so, so basically that year I was declared the top analytical chemist in that, what was it, 1986, I guess it was. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, then... Um, the other award is an ACS Division of Analytical Chemistry Award, and that was in chemical instrumentation. Okay. And and both of those were really for my work on lasers. And, and uh, you know the the Fisher Award was was for you know just being sort of like an all around analytical chemist who 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 developed the area of laser spectroscopy for analysis, and then the the divisional award was for all the instrumentation that I built over the years, and particularly for the, the picosecond spectrometers and stuff like that. Uh, so, okay, yeah. good, but very nice and well-deserved. You, I, One other one was the Department of Chemistry and Engagement Award. Do you recall receiving that? An engagement award at one time? Engagement award. Yeah, there was a list of, of some awards and things, and I happened to see that. And some, some of the sources I also use, we do have some newspaper files to set up uh, archives, and I happened to come across yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah. No, I haven't a clue. I, I do remember winning the. Uh, what the devil is. I, I don't have that. I don't, I, I'm looking at my wall, and I don't have it here. I only uh-huh. have my two research awards here in the office. Uh-huh. Um, it was. It was I'm trying to remember the name of what it is. It's it's, it's a diversity award. Okay. And um, Ken Burns and I got it one year, and then there was a student who I didn't know. Um, and so I was the first faculty member to ever get that award. And I'm trying to remember what the name of the award is. It has a name, but it was for it was for diversity. Right. And both Ken and I got it because he at that time. During the time of doing the Braille work, he was like the associate treasurer or something like that, mm-hmm. and and he was the one who was in charge of funding for handicap uh, issues, and and he was the one who made that whole program financially possible. Mm-hmm. Okay, well that's nice. I'm, that's good to know, and uh, I made a note on that. And then your professional associations, um, American Chemical Society, and also you were on the National Bureau of Standards panel for analytical chemistry in the mid '80s. Yeah. That? Okay. Yeah. And, and matter of fact, it, it, it was pretty close to the end of that. Eventually, the, the Congress, in their great wisdom, which they always seem to have, decided that there were too many consultants in the federal government. <laughs> and and even though this was an advisory committee and had absolutely nothing to do with consulting, the only way they could give us enough money to actually pay for the hotel room and meals in Washington was to declare us consultants. Oh. <laughs> and, and then the federal rules allowed them to actually pay our hotel bill. <laughs> you know, Interesting. And, and so, Interesting. So the committee disappeared shortly, within, easily within five years of when I was on the committee. Oh. But that was, a, that was a, a great committee. I mean, that was a committee of people who set the tone for what the National Science Foundation was going to support in chemistry for the next couple of years. And so it was it was a lot of real heavy hitters, a lot of people in the National Academy were on it and it was it was it was an onerous but still one of the most enjoyable committee assignments at the national level that I ever had. Yeah. That it was just all really absolutely first rate people who were on it. It was yeah. just really enjoyable. It was a good ex- a very good experience for you. Yeah, right. that's right. Yeah. Um, then you were also a member of the Optical Society of America and the Society for Applied Spectroscopy as well. Yeah, okay. yeah. The, the Society for Applied Spectroscopy, I was just elected a fellow of that in uh, October. Okay. And the interesting thing is that this is really incredible in a way that at the, at the same meeting, my thesis advisor, David Hercules, was inducted as a fellow. My first PhD, Joel Harris, was inducted as a fellow. And my second PhD, Mary Worth, who's, who's now the Brooks Fortune Chair of Chemistry at Purdue, she was inducted. And so there were four of us from the same academic family who were inducted oh. at the same session. And, and I checked, the people who ran the program didn't even know that, that, that any of us worked for anybody else. They, they were completely clueless about that, that had nothing to do with it at all. Oh. 
Very good. Congratulations. That's nice. How about family? Uh, family. Do you have children? And um, uh, what did any of them come to Purdue? No, no. Okay. Um, I have two children from a former marriage, uh -huh. and and uh, my wife Joyce has one from a former marriage, and the two oldest. Brad, <clears throat> Brad and Jennifer. Jennifer was is my stepdaughter, and Brad's my son. They both went to IU. Okay. And at the time that they went to college, I was teaching general chemistry, and they said that they would never ever come to Purdue while I was teaching general chemistry. <laughs> and uh, they didn't want to take I had a, a chance. Reputation as a real taskmaster. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, so anyway, they went to IU, and and. You know, my son majored in history, and, and my, my stepdaughter majored in English and social relations, as she called it. And, and uh, then my the youngest daughter was was eight years behind those two, and and she got a degree in landscape architecture at Ball State. Okay. And and you know that's why she she went to Ball State, and again sure. she was happy to get out of town. When when you're under faculty, it's amazing how you're, and particularly like I said, if you have a high profile position where you're teaching thousands of students, your children really want to be at some other school. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, now the retirement. You, uh, I know you're a fellow at a, uh, a company in which you're in the office right now. Uh, did you start to take that on after you retired? I actually started consulting for the company from pretty close to their day one and, okay and well I was trying to figure out exactly when it was that I I, I I have to almost go back to financial records to, to see when sure. I started cashing checks from the company but it was quite some time it, it was at least two years before I retired mm -hmm. and and they just paid me it was basically piecework you know we need an algorithm to do this you know we need you to write some code to do that and and um, my wife Joyce had backed off to eighty percent as part of the you know the partial early retirement thing, and she didn't work on Fridays. And I had rearranged my teaching schedule so that I only taught on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I was always grateful for the chemistry department to allow me to do that. And then I spent Fridays down here in Indianapolis with the company consulting. Uh -huh. And then we have an awful lot of friends down here, most of them who were former graduate students from that we knew at, at uh, Purdue. And they have children, and at that time we didn't have any grandchildren, and they have children and we like being around young people. And, and so we, we had a house built in Zionsville and we would actually live down here Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and then live in our house in Lafayette, you know, for the rest of the week. Sure. And, and so we owned two homes for two years, which was a real pain in the behind, but it, it eventually worked out. And so then when we retired, we were really lucky because we retired, you know, in the beginning of May of 2008, and we sold our house two weeks later. And, wow. You lucked uh, out. Yeah, that's right. Sure. With the way the housing market is, we certainly felt blessed. Right. Uh, Whereabouts were you living, Dr. Lyle? We, we live in Zionsville. No, I mean when uh, you lived in Lafayette. Oh, when we lived uh -huh. in Lafayette. Uh -huh. Okay, we lived um, out past the airport, sort of on, you know, on Newman, off of Newman Road, on okay. the way to Fort Wyattonon. Sure. Okay. All right. I understand. All right. I live um, uh, northwestern, right across from the uh, Mollenkopf Athletic Center between Bexley and Northridge. Oh, okay. So it's okay. Very, very close yeah. to. Close to Ross 8. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you were close to the action. We were, we always felt lucky because of both of us interacting with so many students. We were we felt really lucky that our the little subdivision we lived in nobody knew about and we could hide. So. <laughs> you had your own little place, right? Okay. Right. Do you have a, a Purdue tradition that you'd like to share with us? No. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's really funny because people will say to me. Well, how come you don't have boilermaker plates or something? And I said, well, I didn't go to Purdue. You know, I worked at Purdue. Right, gotcha. <laughs> but, I, but I enjoyed my job. My job was fantastic. I, right. I just can't think of a job that I would have liked more. And over the years, it's just it, it's just hard to tell you how many how many different schools, companies, and different people tried to hire me away from Purdue and. You know, eventually, I would, you know, a couple times I was really serious because they wanted me to go to Lawrence Livermore and work in a laser program. And at one time, Duke University tried to hire me out. And Duke is so pretty. It's such a beautiful school. And, and 
you know, every time what kept me at Purdue was the people that that you know, particularly the analytical chemistry group was, was so strong. We, I mean, we were ranked number one in the nation all the way to somewhere in the 90s when we dropped down to number two. Right. And um, and the other thing was that that I always felt like I had terrific support at Purdue, and 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 that was from just like professional support staff to to people who worked in shops and so forth, sure. all the way up to the president. You know, you know, and and right. I and I I always felt that I had a dean and a provost and a president, uh, you know, and department head who really cared about what was going on and really understood. Um, you know what first what first rate was, and 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 tried to really make the operation first rate, right. and, and and so anyway, I I always felt that that I had this tremendous support from people and and people who I really liked and admired and, and got along with, the people who laughed, and work hard, but they played hard too, and, and had a good time. All right, so. sounds good, very good. Do you have a uh, out, any outstanding event that you'd like to share with us? I think. You've, that some of those comments certainly fall within that per, uh, parameter. You just what, really what kind of an, event? An, an outstanding event. You had a lot probably, but I think what you just said, a lot of the things all work together. You just really enjoyed every day. That's right. And yeah, that, and that's yeah, a, that's and, outstanding. You know, I came from the East Coast, and I really came here with great trepidation because I, I knew nothing about the Midwest and. You know, and my comment after a number of years was that that you know the day-to-day -day quality of life in in West Lafayette was as good as any place I'd ever seen, and since I traveled so much, I had no desire actually to live any other place because you know some other place like San Diego might be maybe a little more exciting for warm salt water and stuff like that, but I could go there anytime I wanted to go because I travel all the time. There you go. And and I thought West Lafayette was a terrific place to raise a family and and just to come home to to, right. to what, you know you're tired of traveling come back and you come back home and, and West Lafayette was a terrific place. All right, and you're glad to be back. I'm in any close and we're getting close to closing, so I'm going to leave it to you. If you have any comments, something that I didn't ask, or if you want to make any further com uh, comment on something that we talked about. No, I don't think so. Okay, I'm going to log off and then I'm going to make a comment. I'll, I'll just take off the.